Hello, my name is Christina Ozunova and today I'm going to present you a quantitative comparison of generative shape models for medical images. As their name already describes, generative shape models model the natural shape variations in medical images, um, typically using a low dimensional representation. And they are very frequently used for model-based segmentations since they constrain the natural shapes of the structures we want to segment. Roughly said, there are two types of uh, shape models, the conventional statistical shape models and deep learning methods. We do have some general knowledge about those methods. For example, the conventional statistical shape models have been around for a long time and they have already established um, they have a very intuitive interpretation. However, they have a rather linear nature and also require many training samples. And there are many extensions that try to deal with those issues. And still, the major problem that remains is that uh, shape models require point-based one-to-one correspondences. Those are indeed not needed for deep learning models. Um, here, we simply can use pixel-based labels of the shapes. Uh, also, deep learning models are well known to be very flexible since they are nonlinear. However, they require many more training samples and are much harder to interpret. Even though we know th those properties, the literature lacks of a concrete comparison of such uh, shape models. Uh, and this is the aim of our work to uh, compare in a systematic manner two traditional methods versus two deep learning approaches. And we compare them in terms of their ability to reproduce unseen samples and to generate new realistic samples. We do so for varying uh, training set sizes to see how this affects the final results. First uh, statistical shape model I'm going to present is the conventional one. Here we have a training um, data set, uh, typically some point-based representation of shapes. Uh, we vectorize those and thanks to PCA we end up having a mean shape and a shape space uh, which is built from the eigenvectors corresponding to the first few eigenvalues. Now if we want to reconstruct an unseen sample we need to find the right coefficients for the eigenvectors and if we want to generate new samples uh, we need to sample those coefficients from a known distribution. There is a major drawback with the standard uh, shape models, which is called the high dimension low sample size problem, which means that we typically have a much larger dimension of the data we want to describe than the um, data set sizes. So let's imagine we only have two training um, samples, in this case, um, shapes of the hand. And in the one hand, the uh, pinky finger is spread and in the other, the thumb is spread. Now our shape space is only able to describe that when the pinky finger is spread, the thumb isn't, and vice versa. So if we now want to fit to a shape that has both of those fingers spread, this would be impossible. An extension of the uh, standard shape models is the locality-based extension, which also considers the, independen the independence of distant parts, in this case those two fingers. This is done so by manipulating the covariance matrix. So if we have three training samples like shown here and a covariance matrix built from them, we now want to say that distant parts are independent from each other. This means that we can simply set their covariances to zero in the covariance matrix like this, uh, and they will become independent. However, a typical problem with this would be how to set the threshold of distances. Um, for example, is the ring finger dependent on the uh, pinky finger or not? And uh, with this issue here is dealt in a multi-level manner where multiple um, scales of localities are considered and combined into one shape space that uh, describes more global and more local information at once. So those were the two statistical shape models I wanted to present. And the first um, deep learning approach is um, autoencoders. Autoencoders are typically neural networks containing of two parts. Um, the first part is the encoder that takes an input image and translates it into a latent encoding. And the second part is a decoder, which takes this latent encoding and tries to reconstruct the input image as flawlessly as possible. 
Now, if we want to reconstruct an input, an unseen input image, we need to input it through the trained encoder and then through the decoder. If we want to generate unseen samples, uh, we need to uh, sample a random latent uh, vector and um, input it to the decoder. However, there is a problem uh, when sampling Z like this because the distribution of the latent space is unknown. So let's imagine we have this distribution, a few clusters, which is actually pretty probable, and we sample a Z that lies somewhere outside of those clusters. <laughs> now the generated image will be highly implausible, and uh, to overcome this issue, an idea is to constrain the distribution of the latent space. This is done by an extension of autoencoders, the variational autoencoders, uh, which also consider an additional distribution of the latent space, typically a normal distribution. So now the um, encoder predicts a mean, a, a standard deviation, and the standard deviation is then um, varied by some random factor, and we can now generate our Z vector. The main advantage of this method is that now uh, we can sample a Z from a normal distribution and be pretty sure that the generated shape uh, will be very plausible. We tested those four methods on freely available 2D chest radiographs. Um, they all had ground root segmentations of four, five structures, both clavicles, both lungs, and the heart, um, which were uh, described by point-based representations um, that we used for the shape models, and also generated segmentation labels for the autoencoding models. To be fair against all methods, uh, we evaluated in terms of contrabase distances, which were extracted from the points or from the labels. We evaluated in terms of generalization ability, which is the ability to reconstruct unseen samples, and in terms of specificity, which is the ability to generate new realistic samples. To be fair here, for all methods, we sampled Z from a normal distribution with mean and standard deviation approximated from the training dataset. Also, an important fact is that we computed those properties for varying training set sizes uh, from 5 to 130 to see how this affects the final results. So those are the results we get. Um, on the top, we see the generalization ability and on the bottom, the specificity. The orange line describes um, the standard shape models. The um, yellow line corresponds to vocality-based shape models. Variational autoencoders are described by blue and uh, standard autoencoders by purple. As we can see, the generalization ability of the uh, standard shape models is much worse than the one of the other three methods. And if we have a closer look at the larger um, training sets, we can see that um, the locality-based shape model is just a little bit worse than the deep learning methods, maybe half of a millimeter worse. And if we have a look at the smaller training data set sites, we see that those values are nearly the same. Um, however, an important uh, detail to measure at this place is that those bars, the purple and the um, blue ones, they correspond to the uh, percentage of not generated labels um, of the deep learning methods uh, because the training data set size is so small that they are not uh, able to learn all labels properly. Uh, and we see that for small training set sizes under 20, this is um, almost 40%. Um, and this can also be seen for the specificity. However, this doesn't happen when we consider shape models, and since their nature is to always reproduce all labels. This can also be seen in the generated data. So let's imagine we want to reconstruct those original labels um, with an autoencoder, which is trained only on five samples. We see that the small structures, the clavicles up there, um, never get reconstructed, even uh, if we use weighted dice loss. And if we enlarge our training data set, we see that the clavicles slowly but steadily get reconstructed, and in the end, they um, get reconstructed with a really high probability. This doesn't happen when we consider shape models. We see that uh, no matter how small the data set is, the clavicles always get reconstructed. Another important property we wanted to evaluate was the latent space of the methods. Um, first of all, in terms of compactness, so shape models appear to be much more compact. Um, they had up to 55 modes in our experiments. 
uh, for the autoencoding models, um, this is a parameter we need to set. We set it here to 512. This is the length of our C vector, um, since this was the best uh, setup for our experiments. Another experiment we can make is uh, to pick two shapes and interpolate between them in their latent space. Uh, and we see that for the different methods, the interpolations are pretty smooth, which means that our latent space is smooth and doesn't have any holes in it. Still, there is some ambiguity in the latent space of deep learning methods. Um, if we encode an input image and reconstruct it, we would expect that the encoding of the input image is the same as the encoding of the reconstruction. This is indeed given for statistical shape models per default. However, if we measure those, distance, those distances for um, autoencoding models, we'll see that the values are much larger than zero, um, which means that the latent space is very ambiguous. And every time we reconstruct an image uh, and reconstruct its reconstruction again and again and again, we'll uh, land on a different spot in the latent space um, moving through it. So to conclude, I presented you a comparison between uh, different shape models to conventional shape models and to deep learning methods. Um, the deep learning methods delivered best generalization and specificity for larger data sets. However, for smaller data sets, the uh, conventional shape models, especially the locality-based shape models, um, were much more robust. And also we saw that their latent space is much more compact and easier to interpret. For future work, we can imagine to compare a few more models, for example, also GANs, and do a little bit more elaborate evaluation. Thank you very much for your attention.